Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hey everyone and welcome to Raising Parents, the Parenting Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Dina Sargent. Let's get started. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode. Now, I've always heard a lot about the positives and the negatives of children focusing on their athleticism, especially when it comes to balancing school and the amounts of homework that you get as you get older. But having an interest in athletics, I've recently learned helps in the developmental growth of children. Now, we're joined today by an individual that is internationally recognized in the psychology of sport and parenting, Dr. Jim Taylor. Thank you so much, Jim, for joining me on the show today. Great to be with you, Dina. We'll have fun chatting it up. No, I'm excited. I was reading about you, the extensive amount of experience that you have, not only in dealing with parents and, and young athletes, but also athletes themselves. And it's, it's very impressive in the different kinds of sports that you've consulted in. Well, I'm, I'm driven by a passion to share ideas to help people. Um, parents raise healthy kids and for kids to be as healthy as they can be. So, uh, so it's just a joy to be able to contribute in some way. So as a psychologist, and that is your, your trade, I'm assuming, your professional career. I have a PhD in psychology, yes. Perfect. Um, what is your role in educating parents on the importance of having young athletes? Well, first of all, I think it's important to realize that parents have a huge impact on their kids in terms of their athletic life as well as their overall personal development. And the, the fact is that all parents love their kids and want the best for them. So they're incredibly well-intentioned, but oftentimes they're misguided. They just don't know what to do, especially in a culture where, where perfection, where success, where winning is, is absolutely revered, that a lot of times parents get those messages from, their, from our culture our achievement culture, and then they direct them at their kids in unhealthy ways. So a lot of what I do with parents is, is help them take those that love and those good attentions and their desire to help their kids become successful, happy people with good relationships and show them how to do it and also show them in ways that, that they're not helping. Perfect. Now, what has been the most common frustration a lot of parents sort of convey to you about young athletes. Yeah, I think it's every parent thinks their child has the capacity to be a world-class or professional athlete. Um, in fact, a number of years ago, there was a survey done that asked um, parents of high school varsity athletes. That means very good young athletes at high school, ninth through 12th grade, um, if they, whether their kids would become professional or Olympic athletes. And 26% said yes. Now, wow. six, in, in reality, statistically speaking, if you take a decimal point, and add a bunch of zeros to the right, and then add, add a number, that's the real likelihood. So it's it's incredibly unlikely that your kids are gonna be really successful athletes. In fact, a very small number compete in college, which is a very something a lot of kids in the US aim for, um, You know, much less being on a varsity team in high school. And so the chances of becoming a great successful athlete, very, very slim. And, uh, but of course, again, every parent thinks their kid is the most talented, the most beautiful, most intelligent kid in the world. Um, statistically speaking, not, not all of them can be. And so a lot of what I do is help ground parents in reality. And also what I truly, really try to emphasize is that by doing things that take the pressure off of kids actually helps them become more successful. You so often, um, parents pressure expectations as well as our culture, our achievement culture's expectations and pressure um, is like putting on a, a 30 pound weight vest on a kid and then asking them to go out on the field, the court, the course. So just imagine a child, they're, this, they're on the sidelines of a, of a soccer pitch and they're made to put on a 30 pound weight vest. How are they gonna feel? Weighed down, heavy, sluggish, how are they gonna perform? Well, clearly not well. 
And so that's what happens when unhealthy attitudes, beliefs, expectations, and pressure are put on kids. Um, again, parents are well-intentioned. They think they're helping their kids become successful, but they're not. They're actually interfering with the process. So a lot of what I do is getting parents to step back and really understand what will help their kids become successful, but also what will help them become happy. Because um, my first parenting book from many years ago was called Positive Pushing, How to Raise a Successful and Happy Child. And in the book, I talk about how when parents have kids, it's almost like they're at the supermarket. They can get into one checkout lane, either the success checkout lane or the happy checkout lane. But they're like separate checkouts. You can't have both. But in fact, what I try to convince parents of is that they that being successful and happy are mutually inclusive. You can't be successful without being happy. And you can't be truly happy without some degree of success. And so it's a matter of finding that balance between encouraging kids, pushing them in positive ways, while also not putting so much pressure on them that not only does it interfere with their ability to be successful as athletes, but it also takes away their happiness and also it hurts the relationship with parents. Because I've seen many kids over the years who they, they hated their parents because their parents were pushing them and pushing them, even if, even if they were incredibly successful. They didn't have a relationship with their parents. And for me, that that's an absolute tragedy. No, it it sounds like the the pressure. There's either pressure to to play a sport or to not play a sport, especially when it comes to, um, especially in the U.S. From what I hear, obviously I'm not in the U.S. But um, sort of seeing how the U.S. is based, and when they talk about the amount of scholarships that go on, like sports scholarships and different, like the amount of pressure that puts on a child and parents to succeed in either athleticism or any other field, there's going to be that much of um, relationships can be, like you said, tarnished and sort of ruin the relationship between a parent and a child. So it seems like there's a lot of um, pressure to do well rather than to really enjoy what they're doing. Yeah, then that's for sure. And especially these days, and this goes for Australia as well as in the US, where kids are, parents feel this pressure to get their kids involved an extremely early age um, in specializing in a sport. And, and or this, this also can apply to music, it can apply to chess, to any other area, any other area of, of achievement. And in fact, unfortunately, what happens that is kids become so narrowly focused that they're not able to develop themselves athletically in broader areas. So, so the conventional wisdom with developing professional and Olympic athletes is you have to start really, really early. And then there are certainly some sports that require it, like women's gymnastics, all of that's changing. Um, but overall, for the most part, you know, yeah, so athletic success often doesn't happen until you're in your late teens and most often tw in your 20s. And so the, the, the research shows, though, that by starting kids early, that can lead to chronic injury. It can lead to burnout. It can lead to loss, lead to loss of motivation. So starting them early actually in, in a very specialized way actually prevents them kids from potentially becoming successful to some to some degree. Mm -hmm. Well, there's there's a bigger double knife, double edged sword there when it comes to sports. Either that, or some sports, like you said, require them to start early in order for them to really succeed. But then that can cause a lot of burnout. Even not just sports, but when it comes to, I guess, in musically as well. When it comes to music, as so many other sort of outside of the normal school curriculum sort of things, like extracurricular activities, there's a lot of things that sort of can inhibit them to so many different other things like burnout and lack of love for the thing that they're actually really trying to build their career on. Yeah. And uh, this has been some classic research uh, over the years that has looked at what happens to kids between the ages of age and eight, between the ages of eight and 13. And there's an incredibly high dropout rate that 70% of kids drop out of organized sports between those ages. And the number mm -hmm. one reason it's not fun. Number two reason, it's too stressful. And so, you know, you, you can have a kid who is a superstar at 11, but if they're hating the sport when they're 13 or 15 or 18, then then it's not worth it. And then obviously the investment of all that early effort um, didn't pay off. So so a lot of what I do is try to convince parents that that allowing the kids to drive the participation and the commitment and to focus early on on enjoyment and skill building and then when it comes time, yes, at some point it is necessary to specialize and become more focused on a sport. And that's when hopefully they are committed to it, that they love it, and they're willing to do the work for it. And then they have a chance. 
because if you know if they work unbelievably hard specializing in a sport um, up until they're 13 and then they hate it and they quit, well, that didn't benefit the kid athletically or in terms of their personal development. And that is such a great introduction to what we're talking about today. And I, I can't wait to get diving into it even more. Um, but before I do, I'd love to get to know some of your recommendations as well as some of your interest in different areas that we're going to be asking you today in terms of um, playing our little get to know you game that we always like to start off with. Uh, so first off, do you have a favorite book that you could recommend to us? Oh boy, you know, I get asked this question um, and um, I tend not to read other people's work because I do, I, I've written 19 books and five parenting books. And so um, I want the books that I write about to, um, to be my ideas. So the, there are wonderful books out there, but um, I feel kind of bad that it, nothing particularly comes off the top of my head. Okay, well, that's fine. You could recommend one of your, other, one of your own books as well if, you, if there's one that fits the topic today. Well, one that fits the topic, um, well, there, there are two. One is called um, Raising Young Athletes. Um, that, that came out of maybe five years ago. And then my most recent one is uh, Train Your Mind for Athletic Success. It's about how to train the mind to, to help athletes achieve their goals. Oh, perfect. Well, that sounds like a, it sounds like a very, um, very well, well-focused book for today. <laughs> it does, I think so, yes. Um, now, when it comes to podcast, do you have a podcast that you have recently enjoyed? No, I don't. I don't listen to podcasts. I'm on them a lot, but um, I don't. I don't listen to many podcasts. I don't have the time. Okay, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> now, for role models, do you have a a role model that you look up to? No. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Well, that is pretty much the get to know you question. So that's totally fine. Don't worry, I should have prepped you before that when it comes to that. Um, but that's all fine. Um, so we're going to get started with the interview. So I know that everyone has a very different understanding as to what parenting and being a parent is. To you, to your definition, what? how would you define what parenting is? Yeah, well, first of all, an interesting thing that's happened over the last 15 or 20 years is that um, parent, parent needs to be a noun. He said, well, you, you were a parent. Now it's become a verb, something you do, you parent. And that's really changed the dynamic because, you know, in my generation um, and past generations, parents didn't think too much about raising their kids. They just sort of did what they did. And, and there, was, there was good stuff about that and there was not so good stuff. But now there's so much pressure on parents that, that they have to raise their kids a certain way. And if they don't, and, and, and the problem with, 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 with parenting is, you get overly invested in it. So how people will view you as a person is determined by how your kids are. And so so the, the challenge there is that there are a lot of things that parents can't control. And, and there are a lot of influences on, on, on kids other than their parents, whether it's peers, coaches, teachers, a popular culture, the internet, social media, for, as well as genetics. And so it puts a lot of parents on pressure and so it puts a lot of pressure on parents to to be awesome parents, but the reality mm -hmm. is that 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 a lot of what we a lot of what kids become is out of our control. Now there are certainly a lot of things we can do, but fundamentally, parenting involves loving your kids, um, teaching them respect and compassion and empathy and joy, and helping them become the best versions of themselves. And that's really what it boils down to. And and you don't have to try that hard. And the harder you try, often it backfires because what happens is when parents become overly invested in, in the sports kids participate in, in the grades their kids get at school, in how they look and how they dress, then what happens is then, then if, if kids don't live up to those expectations and those beliefs and that investment of parents, then, then the kids feel like they're inadequate and the parents are often angry and frustrated. And so, yes, of course, you need to care and love about your kids, but you don't, you don't want to care too much to the point where how they do is seen as a reflection on you as a person, and then you're worried about being judged. And so it's, it's a tricky balance, but a lot of it is, is, is not what you do specifically. It's just who you are. And if you're a loving, caring, supportive, positive person, then you're going to pass 
those attributes, those values and beliefs on your kids. But if you're talking about, you know, wealth and power and status and physical appearance and grades and results all the time, you're going to pass that along to your kids as well. And those, that kind of focus isn't healthy because it used to be that in our culture, that our culture mostly sent good messages to our kids. And so parents were supported. So even if parents didn't always send the best messages, they got healthy messages from others and, and other institutions. But now because the internet, social media, it's all about money and appearance and so on, that, that parents have to try harder. And it's exhausting. And so a lot of parents, either they just give up, give up because it's like nothing I can do matters, which might be a good thing in some cases, or they try to, to fight harder against it. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, then that becomes a burden on the child. So what do you think that expectant parents need to be aware of through their transition to being a parent? The, the best things for parents to be the best parents they can be is to be happy with themselves. And so I'm a big believer that if you have kids, get into therapy, get into counseling, you know, because we have a tendency to, to, to replay our own childhood. And a lot of us, as we're all human beings, we all have baggage from our childhood and we will often pass that on to our kids, just like we do genetics, hair color and height and body type and so on. And one of the great gifts we can give our kids is not our baggage because they'll get their own because that's just a part of being, that's just part of the human condition. Um, but, but too often, if, if we have fears, we pass the fears on to them. If we have ang anger, if we have in, in, inadequacy, we pass those things on to our kids. And so it's in, in, you know, parenting brings out the best in us. It also brings out the worst in us. Um, but hopefully it also challenges us to make changes. And I, I've worked with some parents over the years who were just going down a bad road with their kids. Like I remember one young, mother, a young tennis player who basically kind of screwed up her two older kids. But by gosh, she was going to get this kid right, <laughs> and and in doing so, in, in like trying so hard to get, make to make it right with her third child, she was doing the same thing, and it took tremendous courage on her part and tremendous willpower and strength to make a change, in in sort of who she was in a way, and 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 her third child and all all her kids turned out fine, but her third child uh, really blossomed into an outstanding young woman and is a to this day is, is a great person. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing just how much pressure there is on a lot of parents to, like you said a little bit earlier, when it comes to how social media is, like they're having to work, push themselves so much harder to redirect the child's focus and to just being content, just trying to teach their kid to be content when there's so many, so many things out there that's sort of pushing them to, to see their inadequacy in every aspect and to say that, okay, there's an 18 year old that's got a million dollars at the moment and who has worked so hard and is a million is a millionaire. And then there's an 18 year old who barely finished high school. And there's so many different, like the reality of so many things. So like society really pushes us to really look at the, look at the person that's worth a million dollars rather than worth just them being content with themselves. Right. Well, um, the, the fact is there's always been comparison, but comparison typically was within our community because that's as far as we could reach. And mm -hmm. so it was, you know, who our kids went to school with, who our friends were in the neighborhood. But now it's, it's, it's the entire universe of information out there. So kids and, and parents compare themselves to, to this, uh, you know, these ideals that are uh, uh, quite absurd. And, and generally, if, you, if you're always looking at everything's the best, the most wonderful, and the most incredible, it's hard to live up to that. And so social media has really made things worse because it used to be our, our homes were, were um, impermeable membranes. Like there were walls, and the only thing that could get in a long time ago was three TV channels, and before that, a couple of radio stations. But now it's <laughs> not even a semi-permeable. It is an entirely fluid wall because of the internet. And social media, uh, sadly, has created an environment where kids are bombarded by messages almost 24-7, at least all of their waking hours. And the fact is, the internet and social media, they are not the problem per se. They're simply a reflection of the problem. So mm -hmm. fundamentally, our, our culture has always been driven by money. It Now there's just simply more opportunities to get in 
children and parents and everybody else's psyches to sell more things. And and the internet, with social media, um, online companies, uh, tech companies, they will say anything and do anything to make more money. Um, as an example, um, big tech, capital B, capital T, um, spends billions of dollars every year on what's called persuasive technology. Basically, mm -hmm. it's figuring out ways through various online platforms, whether apps or what have you, to um, persuade people to buy stuff, to look a certain way, to believe certain things. And as a parent, it's incredibly hard to, for us to resist those messages because we're human, because we are products of our culture. And it used to be our culture was much more narrow, and it was an ex and our culture was an expression of who we were, popular culture, meaning from the populace. But now popular culture is not guided by the populace. It's guided by big business. And so instead of an expression of, of who we are, we are being told who we are. We're being manipulated into who we are. And so it, parents are exposed to this just like everybody else, and it's hard to resist those messages. I have to push my kids really hard, otherwise they're not going to become successful. They have to look a certain way. They have to achieve certain grades. They have to be good in this or that or the other thing. Mm -hmm. And it's to our detriment as parents as well, because it's tremendous pressure. And, and you, you can't win, because there's always going to be kids who are quote unquote better than our kids. Mm -hmm. And so, so, but, but it's, it's incredibly hard to resist because we are all victims. I just wrote a co article about this. Literally, I posted it on my blog um, today. We're all victims of our upbringing and our culture. And, and, and but the more parents can take control of the narrative of our, of, of, of our upbringings, our children's upbringings and of the culture and how much gets in, um, that'll have a big impact on how much those unhealthy messages that they're receiving from our culture through the medium of technology and, and the internet um, affects them. Mm -hmm. And more than anything, if, if, if parents can just raise kids with good values, good attitudes and beliefs about themselves, confidence, um, the ability to focus effectively, the ability to interact with other humans, and because obviously with the internet and, and with the pandemic and, and, and remote teaching, um, everything's become through a screen. And that misses out on a lot of really important things. And there's, there's some in early research and certainly a lot of teachers and coaches and parents are saying, my, my kid doesn't know how to interact with other people anymore because they're on their screens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, it's very true. And it's, I think it's a big thing, especially when, it, even when looking at it with the athletic areas and looking at raising young athletes, there's so many people that the for, for example, if you're starting out as a first time skier, you see so many other skiers around you that are 10 times better than you are, but you see them as you get so distracted and trying to be like them that you forget about your own technique. You forget about your own sort of development. And when it comes to that, those kind of challenges, what are some of the other challenges that parents most commonly sort of encounter when trying to raise young athletes and trying to make sure that they're enjoying the sport that they're choosing. Yeah. It's, it's being constantly bombarded by messages from professional sports, from Olympic sports, from the youth sport programs, from the coaches, because youth, youth sports used to be about fun and physical activity and teamwork. Now it's, I call it the youth sport industrial complex. And it's where it's about making money for coaches and in, in sports programs and so on. And again, this goes back to messages. They're constantly being bombarded with these messages that it's all about winning. And if you're a eight year old kid, a 10 year old kid, a 15 year old kid, it's hard to ignore those messages. And at the very least, parents need to counter that and just say, no, that's not true. Because if parents buy into it, the kids are done. These are the most important forces in their, in their lives are going to be telling them if you're not winning, if you're not the best, then what's the point? You're a loser. And, and then you sports become a source of pain and, and stunted development and, and, uh, disrupted, uh, personal growth. Mm -hmm. And it has, it has, it's not only not beneficial, but it's actually destructive. So when it comes to those challenges, how can parents sort of even just acknowledge and address the fact that they're, that the child is sort of a little bit more focused on winning than actually enjoying it. How do they sort of manage those expectations of not only what they want, but what their children want? Yeah. And this is why it's really important to be self-aware and mindful as you raise your children. Um, because again, early on, 
we get these messages about how we're supposed to be as parents. And, and it's kind of impossible standards to live up to. Um, but again, that's what, that's what social media and the internet are telling us. And so it's really important early on in kids' development to, for, for, for parents to sit down and go, be like, what's really important to us? Why do we want our kids to participate in sports or, or whatever domain uh, it might be? And, and to identify the values behind it. Because for me, values are like armor in a family. Because mm -hmm. values are basically things that we believe are important. And that which we believe is important, um, we tend to prioritize in terms of our time, our money, and our energy. And so if, if, you, if, you, if, if, if you're bombarded with these messages that it's all, about, it's all about winning and success and being the best and making a lot of money and being famous, if you, if you, if you buy into that, your kids are, vic are, are, are they're in trouble. But if, if as your kids get involved in youth sports at a young age, and usually these days in the U.S., I mean, kids are playing youth little, little soccer and lacrosse and all these other sports, you know, at five, six years old. And don't even get me started on eight-year-old traveling soccer teams. That's just the epitome of absurdity. But, um, but it exists. And so if parents, as they begin this process, or even before they begin the process, they can ask themselves, like, so why do we want our kids involved in sports? Well, we want them to be, we want our kids to be physically active. We want them to um, be challenged. We want them to build, build resilience and learn how to deal with failure and disappointment. Um, we want our kids to learn how to work well with others. And, and we also want our children to be passionate about their sport. And so if those are the fundamental values that undergird a child's in, in entry into youth sports, then that's going to lay a pretty good foundation. And, mm -hmm. and, but, but that's an ongoing conversation. It's an ongoing process, not only in terms of the messages parents send to their kids, but also making sure that we live that. Because, you know, it, you know do as I say, not as I do. So if you have a parent saying it was all about fun, but you're, you have a, a parent plays some sport, let's say, and they get super frustrated and they're throwing their bat or they're kicking the soccer ball, they're so angry. The, the, the message of what you do comes across much more powerfully than, than, than what they say. Mm -hmm. And then making sure that the kids, as they get more involved in the youth sport pipeline, that they're in programs, youth sport programs, that, um, that actually support what you believe. Because yeah. there are plenty of there are plenty of youth sports programs that are really all about. Uh, if you go to their website, it's like we'll make your kid a champion, we'll help your kid become a um, get a college scholarship, whatever. But there are also yeah. others out there that, that really emphasize balance and thoughtfulness, and and sports are a part of life, not life itself. And so you need to create a community around your kids, youth sport programs, um, uh, uh, other parents. Of, of, of young athletes who have the same kind of values. Because again, it goes to messages. If kids are constantly being bombarded with unhealthy messages from everybody else, the parents' messages will probably break down and fail. And, and that's something that has to be shepherded through. And then as your kids get more and more um, immersed in youth sports, and then of course, as they get older, as maybe they get to be 10, 11, 12, heading into, into teenage years, and they're able to, you're able to then talk to them about these issues and, and have them to get, get, start to get them thinking about what are healthy values. Why do they play in, get involved in sports? Here's a quick example. So I, I work with a world-class athlete in sport and who has been struggling um, the last couple of years. And, and he said, I wish I could just play the way I did when I was a kid. And that was, that was a really profound message for me because you think about why do kids play sports? It's because it's they're fun and they get to run around and 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 it doesn't matter that much. But all of a sudden, and this this can happen at a very young age in youth sports, where all of a sudden it starts to matter, and it becomes a job. Like you got to work hard. No, you got to mm -hmm. play hard, and you have to you have to put in the time and you need to do put in the effort for sure if you want to get good. But there's this shift, and and it just sucks the, the the love out of the sport, and that ties in with why so many kids quit before they enter and enter their teenage years. And so if, if you can get your kid to expose them to a lot of different sports and maybe they'll find one that they absolutely love to do and maybe they want to aspire to be the best. And I totally support that. My, in my youth, I was an alpine ski racer 
And I wanted to be the best ski racer in the world. And I went to a, a, a school in Vermont um, where a lot of Aussies have gone actually um, to, um, to, to strive for that. Now, the chances of me being that, su being that successful, really unlikely. But, but, and, I, and I made it pretty far. I, I competed internationally. I competed against the best in the world, but I didn't make it all the way. But it still shaped me in so many positive ways. All the values, all the beliefs, all the attitudes necessary for success in life. I learned from my sports participation. So it doesn't matter how far you make it. It's do you have these experiences of, again, resilience and dealing with challenges and adversity and disappointment and so on. Um, these are the things that shape who you become, not the winning and the losing, not the success yeah. and failure. And I and think so that's what we focus, and I think that's what we focus on so much as well when it comes to sport. We focus so much on, okay, there's a there's one team going against another team, or there's one person going against another person. And it's not a, um, okay, I'm going to quietly compete, but I'm not really competing against them. Like I'm just like a little banter between two players or two teams you're not sort of seeing that and you don't really see that until you get to the big leagues where they're actually all friends in the behind the scenes but like on the way up to that everyone it looks like everyone despises the other team and it's always I'm gonna beat you I'm gonna get you but when you see like for example when um uh, the Super Bowl comes on and you sort of see the team both sides of the team all friends with each other at the end of it they're all shaking hands they're all really good but you don't see that until you get to those big leagues and you're watching them and you you see how friendly everyone is so it's like everything is a competition up until you get to the big leagues and you realize everybody's still friends it's just a little bit of a quiet battle between each between each side yeah I mean, certainly at the highest level of professional olympic sports it's highly competitive but as you suggest, if you see the best athletes competing, they compete on the field or the court or the course of the hill. But often, you know, a lot of them are, are, are friends and they, they, they keep that separation. And, and, but the fact is, in a way, sports are a zero-sum game. I mean, there are those who make it and those who don't. But again, statistically, the chances of making it are very small. But at the same time, I encourage young athletes to aim high. You, you never know who's going to make it. Somebody's got to play in the Super Bowl. Somebody's got to play in the World Cup. Somebody's got to go to the Olympics. It could be your kid. Mm -hmm. But if you place on them expectations and pressure and all these unhealthy values about competition and winning and so on, it redu reduces the chances of them making it. And in fact, by keeping it fun, by, by, by not allowing parents to become overly invested and just let it be their thing that they're passionate about, because I've seen kids who become pretty darn successful, but then they ultimately quit because they don't love it. And you have to love anything you're going to devote yourself to because it is hard. It's physically hard. It's emotionally difficult. It's socially difficult. It's You're making sacrifices and making choices about how you spend your time. Because if you aspire to be the best, you can't have balance by definition because so much of your energy is going into your sport. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be successful in school because we see a lot of athletes who are outstanding students who also become great athletes. But but the fact is, the more you and young athletes invest, especially in an early age, in their sport and where it becomes too much. So I, I have this thing called the two zone. One of the most dangerous words in, in sports is a simple three-letter word, T-O-O, -O, two. So you want your kids to care about their sport, but you don't want them to care too much. You want it to be important to them, but you don't want to be too important. You want them to give their best effort, but you don't want them to try too hard. Because when they enter the two zone, their self-identity, their self-esteem becomes based upon their accomplishments. But the mm -hmm. nature of sports is you're going you're gonna to lose a lot. Think of baseball. Baseball is a crazy sport. In fact, it's, it's, it's most, you know, as far as having a career in it, it's like the best. Because think about it. You can be successful only one third of the time. That is, say, bat three hundred and make millions of dollars a year. I imagine doing that with house construction or, or brain surgery. You succeed only a third of the time. That you're not going to be doing what you're doing in those areas if the house keeps the houses keep falling down two thirds of the time, or you kill the patient two thirds of the time. Mm -hmm. So you have to, in sports, be willing to fail. And, be able, and to be okay with that, not accept it, not be happy about it, 
but just go, that's a part of the process, it's part of the journey. And if you talk, I, I've been fortunate to work with and know many professional Olympic athletes, and, and that's what they talk about. The lessons learned from failure, the struggles they've been through, the process they went on to succeed, not the gold medals or the million dollar contracts. And so, so it's, it's really important for parents to be able to maintain that perspective, but it's extremely different, difficult when all those messages are telling them otherwise. And so because if young athletes can maintain that perspective and have this healthy attitude toward use, toward their sports, then they're going to continue to love it. They're going to continue to work hard. And then they have the chance to be great. But again, statistically, what, another thing that sort of a side thing that that's sort of part of the at least the American culture is that anybody can who works hard can be the best, and it's simply not true. Mm. There's an old saying in basketball: you can't teach height. So you might you might be the best you might you might have the best hook shot in the world, but if you're not six three as a woman um, and and seven one in in men, you're not playing in the WNBA or the NBA. And so mm -hmm. genetics do matter and not, and you can't just, everybody who works hard can't be experts. Um, so I used to um, do some work a number of years ago at, at a tennis academy in Florida and everybody who went there, they were phenomenal players. And people look at the, 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 uh, the Williams sisters, the Sharapovas, a lot of these young stars who come up in tennis or in, in every sport and look, they, they worked unbelievably hard and they made it. What parents in our culture are, are willing to accept is that for every one of those who made it, there were probably thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands who followed the exact same path, started playing at two years old, play, you know, we're on the, was on the, let's say use tennis court as an example. We're on the court hours a day, all through their young ages. Mm -hmm. And they didn't become the best. Why? Well, either they just didn't have the in, in, innate talent and in that case, if they didn't get good enough genes, it's their parents' fault because they didn't give them good enough genes. And unfortunately, you know, parents are victims of the genetic lottery as well. And so, you know, you get the genes you got and some of those genes, some, some people have genes that will enable them to become geniuses or world-class athletes or musicians, virtuo, virtuoso musicians and so on. Um, but the fact is very few do. So yeah. it's not so clear. Oh, yeah, if you get your kids playing a sport at two and you specialize and you put them all the way, are they going to become good? Yes, very good. Probably yes. But are they going to make it even close to the top? No. Because if you if you look at, let's say, top college players, these are phenomenal athletes in, in every sport. But could they touch a top professional? That wouldn't even be close. But again, what's important is the journey, not the outcome. Even though messages from our culture say it's about the outcome. As far as the development of the person, it's their experience of it, the attitudes, the beliefs, the, the values they take out of it, the habits they develop. That, mm -hmm. that, that if, they be, if they learn these lessons early on and they see their athletic experience as this incredibly positive thing that shaped them as it did for me, then they're going to go to maybe college or, or find some other path in which they have some aptitude and they apply those same abilities, those same tools, and they become really successful in some other area. And, and, but even then, not everybody can be great at something. Statistically speaking, if you know the bell curve, you know, 93% of people are within one standard deviation of average. Very few mm -hmm. people be out at the ends. But it doesn't matter because if you find something you love to do, and you develop some degree of competence at it, it's going to be really satisfying. And, 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 you'll, and you're going to make a decent living in most cases. And, mm -hmm. you know, and ultimately, that's all you can shoot for. And, and if, if you do have the genes and you do have the passion and you are willing to work hard, then yes, maybe you can become great. But it's not the way, first only for parents, not a good financial investment. Better yeah. to put it into a good school. Yeah. Than putting them on this road where, Again, they might become the best. And if you have the money and the, you're willing to do that, they might become great. But it's not the way to bet, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, I think you mentioned a little bit earlier on the positives of participating in sports. So how does the development of social skills and also the peer interactions during middle and late childhood impact a young athlete's overall sports experience? 
Yeah, it's huge because the, the you know the preteen and the teenage years and even younger, it's a time of incredible social development of figuring out who you are, who you want to be, how you want to interact with people, who um, what kind of people you want to be friends with, and so it's it's a, it's a, and you know most pe most kids it, they spend their social time in school, but school they don't choose to do school they have to go to school most kids these days, but they mm -hmm. choose their sports they choose their extra extracurricular activities. And so if they choose a sport that they love to do and they're around other kids who who have a similar passion for their sport, that's like armor against the world. And it's, 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 it's especially important these days where so many kids are just spending hours and hours and hours a day on their phones or on their tablets or on, on, on their laptops. And, and they're basically just sitting there playing games or chatting up or whatever it might be. And so both the physical engagement of the sport as well as the social interpersonal engagement is is it protects them from the sedentary aspects of sitting in front of a screen plus mm -hmm. they're practicing social skills are skills and how do you develop skills you practice them and so if you're out in the field or the court or the course and you're interacting with your teammates yeah, both in terms of communication in terms of playing um as well as how you respond to success and failure together how you deal with conflict these are all incredible opportunities to learn how to deal with people. Because if you want to be mm -hmm. successful in life and if you want to have healthy relationships, which again, for me, is part of being successful, you have to have those capabilities. But if you don't learn them as you're, when you're young, you're not going to have them available when you're old and you're going to suffer for it for sure. So sports go far beyond anything in terms of developing motor skills or staying physically healthy or even just feeling good about yourself because you, you scored a goal or you, you, know, you played well. It also is about interacting with peers and even sports that are individual, you know, like tennis or golf or so on, you're still interacting with people all the time. It's just not quite the same way of, of, of depending on other people like you do in a team sport. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's so many conversations. And I think I said this a little bit earlier when it comes to parents sort of saying that sports is not shouldn't be the focus or there are a lot of parents who think differently saying that they're young athletes sort of pushing how would you go ahead and encourage the like the importance of group sports and sort of the participation in sport even if it's just a small little after school thing with with friends even yeah so so first of all sports are an absolute necessity it's it's just another path toward where you want your kids to be. If you like, if you, you know, if you have a passion for dance or your kid develops a passion for dance or the flute or chess or whatever activity, all those are great in terms of your personal and personal development. I think one of the nice things about youth sports, it also adds in the physical development. That's certainly dance, very physical. And you have to be in incredible physical condition. But, but, you know, we live in, we live now in a world where this, the, the amount of childhood obesity is out of control. And, and that, of course, translates into adult obesity, very unhealthy, and it has all kinds of social and economic costs. So, so if you, you can get your kid involved in sports, sip the very simple reason of they're running around, they're moving, and it, it doesn't have to be organized sports. It can be going, going to the, um, the park and kicking the ball around or throwing the ball around with your kid, or it could be just playing tennis or going for a run or bike ride or, or whatever. It doesn't matter. Now, there are benefits to organized sports. But not every kid, that's not going to be their thing. You know, maybe they're a little rebellious. Maybe they, they don't, maybe they're sort of introverts. Maybe they, they like doing their own thing. They like being different. So they become snowboarders or skateboarders or, or things like that. Or, the, or they just like exercising or whatever it might be. So, you know, ultimately all someone like me can do, and I think coaches and, and you people who advocate for youth sports, um, all they can do is provide the many benefits of it and allow parents to see the benefits and then have the kids experience it. So I, I'm totally for parents exposing their kids to all kinds of sports when they're young, not all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And because like very, very often, parents will be involved in a sport for themselves and then their kids will too, and they'll go down that path. But it might very well be that that's not their thing. And so they get into something else. And, and, but they, they're only going to get into another sport if, if they're given the opportunity to get into another sport. 
And so mm -hmm. I believe in exposing your kids to all kinds of different sports, individual sports, team sports, endurance sports, skill sports. And hopefully, but not always, your kids will gravitate to one particular sport that they really enjoy. Or they mm -hmm. just, or they just, uh, I think a very healthy thing is that they don't feel this need to commit super early and, and, and specialize. They just like playing a lot of different sports. And, so, and especially mm -hmm. it used to be that most sports were seasonal. Now with many sports like soccer, it's all year round. And that's a problem. But, but for the most part in these days, especially for young kids, um, sports are mostly seasonal. Um, and so the kids can, can play soccer in the fall. And um, during the winter, they play volleyball. And in the spring, they play soccer, um, um, uh, they play soccer, whatever it might be. And, and that provides balance. And then if, if, if they become passionate about something, then they can start to specialize. But, but going in, as I talked about earlier, about having certain values about what do my kids, what are my kids going to get out of their sports participation? Having that clarity will help send that message to the kids who will then buy into this, like, oh, I don't need to, my, my, you know, my, my friends are like off every weekend going to some godforsaken place in Central California playing soccer, which is what happens mm -hmm. in the San Francisco Bay Area. And, and everywhere you live here, and I'm sure it's the same in, in Australia, um, there's a place that's not places where I would care to spend my weekends, but kids, but there's the, you know, these traveling soccer teams and that's the life and where I get to stay home and I get to be with my family and I get to do all kinds of different things. That's way better. So, mm -hmm. so it's really important that, that again, parents have clarity about why their kids are involved and, and, and also ultimately let the, let the kids drive the, drive the participation. Because if a kid in early age finds a passion and they want to be the best, again, that's armor against all the toxicity that exists in our in our culture. Because it, mm -hmm. think of it this way: um, a kid's I don't know, fourteen or fifteen, and they're not a soccer; they don't play any sports. And their friends say, "Let's go out and go drinking tonight." Mm -hmm. And and if they've got nothing that matters more than being accepted by their friends and having and being in, and hanging out with their friends, they're going to go down the bad road. But if they're a soccer player, tennis player, um, a golfer, whatever the sport it is, and it's a Friday night and they've got a big game the next day or they've got practice the next day, and but some of their friends from school want to go down the bad road, they're going to go, you know what? My sport is much more is, is really important to me, and so I'm not mm -hmm. going to go down that bad road. And mm -hmm. that life might have been saved right there. So mm -hmm. th there, there's so many incredibly powerful benefits to, uh, to use sports. But only if it's a it's if, it, if it's approached in in a healthy uh, way that's grounded in healthy and positive values and attitudes and beliefs. Mm -hmm. So I I like the way you put it at the end there, especially when it comes to sort of making sure that the child really enjoys it rather than just doing it because the parents make the parents happy or just because oh, it's I'm tired of saying that I don't like this and they're not listening to me. Like there needs to be some kind of balance between what they enjoy and what the parents will be there to support them. So it's, it's interesting when you talk about the, the amount of discipline that sort of come in with sports, because you don't really talk about that often. You see the success stories and you see, oh, they came up from nothing and they're big athletes now, but you don't really hear about the amount of discipline that sort of comes about when dealing with the amount of restrictions that they've had to put up themselves, not just diets or anything, but like the lifestyle and the amount of lifestyles that big athletes now deal with, they're also having to balance that in balancing of being famous and balancing the amount of fame that sort of comes in with them. So there's a lot of, there's still a lot of restrictions that they're having to sort of find the discipline within themselves in order to really be successful. Yeah. And the, the fact is like, you see all these amazing athletes and you think, well, they were just so talented, but you know, LeBron James, Jim Rath and, um, and Messi field Rath, And meaning they just loved going out to the field of the gym or whatever their sport is and putting in the time. And that's the choice they made. Um, mm -hmm. and are they missing out on some things? Perhaps so. Um, but that's the choice they make. And at the same time, there are other kids I've come across who weren't <clears throat> willing to make that choice. Um, <clears throat> they wanted more balance. They wanted a balanced education. They didn't want to have to homeschool or go to some special school far away from home. <clears throat> they want to be able to hang out with their friends. And in that case, they'll, they might choose a level of sports participation that, that's maybe a little more balanced and a little more uh, less time consuming. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And now this leads us in perfectly with the next part of the show, which is practice and habits. Now, this is some of your own practices and especially with, uh, with your own children. What is a practice that you do to sort of encourage them to find, find their own way in the world? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think one of the great things that, um, that my, my wife and I have had really emphasized for a long time was letting our kids feel like they have control over their lives letting them make choices. Now, mm -hmm. fortunately, our girls always seem to make good choices um, and, and that we were in, agree, in agreement with. So it's, it's, so it's actually gone pretty well, but it's really important for, for, for kids to develop the sense of agency. Like, like, like if things aren't the way I want, there's something I can do about it. And be, because mm -hmm. it's easy to sort of become sort of a victim of, of oh, yeah, there's nothing I can do, what do I do? And that's a terrible place to be psychologically and emotionally because you're stuck in a situation that wasn't maybe not of your creation and that you can't do anything about. But if you feel like I have control over my world, then if something's not going the way I want, then I can do something about it. So the sense of agency is really important. Um, another <laughs> thing is, um, is just helping them connect with people and prioritize. So, um, we sent our, our daughters to um, a Wald Waldorf school. I don't know if they have these in Australia, but it's basically a school that introduces technology extremely slowly. So I think no computers until something like fifth or sixth grade. Um, and mm -hmm. and um, my, my girls didn't have phones until they were 13 or 14, and they didn't see a movie until they were 10. And you might think, oh, we're creating freaks here. And my daughters used to joke about that, but now they're in sort of normal school, high school. And, you know, they have friends and they have smartphones and so on, but they have a healthier relationship with technology. Um, this, I would say that the greatest obstacle that parents face these days is technology. And because literally kids and adults, all adults and parents are become addicted to their phones. And I'm not talking about just sort of psychologically addicted, but research has shown that, that um, technology has the same neurochemical effect as drugs, alcohol, and gambling. And this goes back to that big tech spending billions of dollars a year to create persuasive technology. And, and you see it. Kids can't get off their phones. Adults can't get off their phones. And so yes. it takes a lot of energy and a lot of resistance because everybody's, every kid seems to have the latest smartphone or they've got the Apple earbuds or, um, or whatever the case may be. And they're all on different particular social media. And it's hard to resist those, that pressure from our culture especially for our kids, but, oh, come on, everybody else has it and I'm going to be left out. But, you know, my mm -hmm. kids don't have any social media. I mean, they have Pinterest, which is just sort of like a, I, mean, I don't see it as the same, but they don't have Snapchat, they don't have TikTok, and they don't have Facebook, they don't have Twitter. Um, and they do a lot of messaging with their friends, but they're fine. And it means mm -hmm. they can devote their energy to things that are more meaningful, like hanging out with your friends face to face like engaging in the sports and doing hobbies and hanging out with your parents and just being bored sometimes because kids have, have lost the ability to be bored. And um, if, I have a saying that I tell my kids and it irritates the heck out of them is um, that, uh, that, that um, boredom is a failure of the imagination and that boredom is a tool for creativity because if you're bored, you have to come up with something to do. And coming up with something new yep. is creativity. Mm -hmm. But these days, you don't, you're don't. you never bored because it's like, oh, I can just flip through my Instagram or, yep. or whatever social media or, you know, or watch 15-second you know, TikTok videos. And that is not healthy. Now, I'm not, a, I'm, trust me, I'm not a Luddite. I'm not anti-technology. I love technology. I'm way into it. And I use it a lot in my work. Um, I, I use social media in my work. I don't use it in my personal life at all because I, I've got better things to do than document to a, gr a group of people about like what I'm having for lunch, for breakfast. I don't think, I don't think I'm that important. Um, <laughs> but, and, and, and that goes into the whole aspect of for kids that life becomes performative. Like I'm, I'm not just being me, I'm performing for my audience. And, and mm -hmm. then there's to be this disconnect between who I am, my true self and who I want people to think I am that is what I call my, my manufactured self. And so youth sports is an incredible protection against all that because 
if you're out practicing a couple hours a day, that's time you're not spending on your phone. And it's time, and it also enables you to make choices like, okay, yeah, it might be fun to go do something stupid, but I, but my sport is more important to me. Yeah. No, it's technology and the use of it. I think like because I grew up when technology was just being a really big thing and I would, was in high school and I, even though I was homeschooled, there was still that desire to connect. And now that I'm in my mid twenties, I'm 25, almost 26. And I am wanting to be off it more than anything. Like I am, I've weaned myself off of it. I, I've set a limit on each of the different apps of only being on it for an hour a day. And that's, that's the limit. The minute it's on, it's locked and I can't go back in it. And I've set up that for myself because I'm just it's, it's true. It, you collided with it, the amount of information that you get within 30 seconds. And I've realized, especially in the last couple of years, especially after COVID, how much my life really depended on 30, uh, my attention span depended on 30, 30 seconds. I was only able to focus on something for 30 seconds and then my attention was just gone. And that was so much of having to unlearn. So like, the technology use. I love the idea of not being, because I didn't have, my, my first phone was when I was in university and that was literally just a flip phone. I was 18 and I, everyone had like iPhones, the newest iPhone. I was just having the simple Nokia flip phone just to contact people for emergencies. And that was the only thing until I bought my own phone, until I bought it myself when I was about 23. So I've only had a phone in technology for like the last five years or so. And it, the amount of, it's it's been so different growing up, not having that focus and not having, oh, I'm going to, like you said, not posting what I had for lunch every five seconds and, and posting what I'm going to eat for the rest of the day or what my new outfit is. Like it's, I grew up happier without it. I can definitely see the benefit of not having it growing up because it was, so much easier to grow up without anyone else's influence that were negative. So yeah, technology and technology and people will always have a positive, positive and negative, and it'll always have that deep impact that can either really help you or can really disrupt you. Agreed, agreed. And so I, I think it's really a matter of how it's used. And this is all part of the, the journey these days, especially for new parents. Um, where kids grow up with like, wait, you didn't you, you didn't have cell you didn't have cell phones, or wait, the you couldn't just go Google something. What did you do? And and so uh, it's it's a brave new and scary new world, but um, but it's it's really important, and that's why it's so important that parents be extremely thoughtful and deliberate about how they want to raise their kids. Because again, decades ago, previous generations you didn't have to put much energy into it because your kids are going to go to public school or whatever, and they're going to do whatever and they'll be fine. But now there's this fear, you know, I, I think uh, I've read how um, this, this generation, maybe it's millennials um, will be, uh, will be the first generation to be less successful than their parents. And, and as a parent of two teenagers, it's, it's sort of terrifying to think, well, will my kids be able to navigate and survive in, in the big cruel world? And, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, we've heard about a helicopter parents and snowplow parents and all that, all that, that, um, we, it's, it's just finding this balance of letting our kids find their way and letting them suffer and struggle while also we want to help them as much as we can, but not take away their sense of agency because then it's like, oh, then, then they call mom and dad to help, help in a situation rather than figuring out for themselves. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting because like if you think about it, the way that society is sort of like looking into how teenagers and adults are meant to grow up and to be adults. If you don't have a tech company by the time you're 18, you're not successful. Completely. <laughs> yeah. And you know, if you haven't had a startup, you haven't, if you're not saving the world, um, the, uh, the uh, Gre Greta Thalberg, um, in, in a way, I, I so respect her, and, but she's also set the bar so high for every other teenager in the world. Because it's, mm -hmm. if you're not speaking to the UN when you're 16, like what a loser, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> but 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 again, it's it's just like a world, you know, a high level athlete. Very few can reach that level. But that doesn't mean you can't have an impact on the world. 
because not everybody can change the world. Um, very few, but you can change your part of the world um, by, by again, I, I keep going back to values and attitudes and beliefs, but they are the foundation of everything we do. And, and so in one of my books is about the role of, of popular culture and values. And so if, um, if, if, if as parents, we can instill healthy values in our kids, then that can protect them from a lot of the toxicity that it's, that's out there. Mm-hmm. But it, but if we, but if we, if we capitulate to all those toxic messages, our kids are doomed. Yes. No, I, I completely agree. And I think there's so much, there's so much that we can learn from even taking our own phones away for a little bit for two days and see if we can survive on without it. And it's, and I love the idea of really summing up the way we did when it talked about the, the importance of finding those skills and finding what you're good at. Also finding the amount of discipline that sort of takes place within athletics. And it's, it's been amazing actually talking with you. And I want to thank you so much, Jim, for joining me on the show today and for sharing so many different life skills that are really important for not only young athletes to know or kids who are wanting to go into athletic sport, athletic activities, but also parents who are also trying to find their balance between encouraging and pushing. So yeah, thank you so much again, Jim, for joining me on the show today. It's been a great pleasure. I have appreciated talking with you and sharing my ideas. Now, if our listeners want to find out a little bit more about you, is there a place that they're able to go to? Yes, actually, there's this thing called the internet, and um, <laughs> of course, uh, of course, I have a website, um, drjimtaylor.com, drjimtaylor.com. Um, I have uh, on there probably ninety five percent of everything I've ever written is on there, um, free, um, and I've got a blog with all kinds of different topics. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and um, LinkedIn and Instagram. Um, and so I, I usually post articles on everything related to sports and um, and parenting and a lot of other topics um, a couple times a week. So people can contact, can, can fi- find me there and, and reach out to me there as well. Oh, perfect. Well, I'll definitely have those down in the link below for anyone who wants to access it easily. And definitely go and check out some of Jim's work. I've read some of it and it's actually really good. And it's very, I love that it's, it's, very thought provoking a lot of what you've written and I I absolutely loved it so much so yeah thank you again Jim for joining me on the show today my pleasure okay and I hope you guys learned as much as I did about the importance of finding your space in athleticism or finding your space in any type of of out of school thing that you want to do and also encouraging them to look beyond what success is So I hope you guys learned as much as I did and I'll see you all in the next episode. You've been listening to Raising Parents, the Parenting Science Insights podcast produced by the Parenting Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and other podcasting apps available on your devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show sharing it and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people find it so that we can grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at pa.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Dina Sargent. Thanks for tuning in.